Thank you, Natalia, for a very kind introduction. Yes, well, I, I hope, hope you find it a fascinating subject. Uh, it seems a bit gruesome, I admit. Uh, and I, yeah, but um, hopefully you'll see that it's, um, it's my intention, really, to touch upon films, a number of films and themes that you might find familiar in, in Russian and Soviet film, but to sort of try and shed a slightly different light upon them. Uh, and... Um, and, and yeah, well, and, and you can decide obviously for yourself uh, what uh, what interests you about that. I should also say the title has changed a tiny bit once or twice, and the the scope uh, um, change has changed a tiny bit. So um, I think there was a, something on the social media said that I was going to be talking about Ivan uh, Ivan's childhood, and. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I was intending to talk about Ivan Shalter, and I will mention Ivan Shalter, but if you want me to relate it to the uh, narrative I'm going to create, then please uh, put your hand up and, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll do that in questions. So, in her groundbreaking study, Night of Stone, historian Catherine Merridale considered the enormous scale of death, suffering, and loss suffered by Russia and Russians in the 20th century by looking at the ritual practices associated with the commemoration of the dead. A particular focus of Meridale's book are the revolutionaries' attempts to create a new secular red funeral culture, where, um, sorry, where the, I'll come back to that, um, where religion was displaced, where the grave became a tribune for affirmation of the cause, meaning that the focus of a response of action um, meaning that the focus was on a response of action and the fight for a new Russia in order that the sacrifice was not in vain. This left little space for mourning. Meridale's reach is very wide and her materials tend to be from oral history. The lecture I'm about to give you is uh, an attempt to extend the agenda of Night and Stone by examining attitudes to death in the context of early Soviet film which rationalizes and instrumentalizes death and violence from its very earliest and most influential examples, presenting it as meaningful, as a meaningful sacrifice. So a couple of stimuli to this angle uh, are, one is a sort of topical one that I hope you'll find um, relevant. Uh, I certainly did, and, and the other is it from my own work. So one stimulus to this reflection is a sense that there may conceivably be an analogy between the phenomenon of ideological martyrdom and death for one belief, one's beliefs in the context of contemporary Islamic jihadists and uh, Russian revolutionaries. In both cases, ways in which the meaning of death in the cause are conveyed to a wider public are key to their functioning, be those means by eyewitness participant, by film, by the internet. The other part through which I come to this theme is through my previous, most recent book, uh, First Films of the Holocaust, in which I draw attention to the existence of a hitherto neglected corpus of Soviet films that depicted Nazi atrocities committed against the Soviets and other peoples of Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, in this book, I argued that these films constituted cinema's first attempt to grapple with the difficulties and issues involved in the representation of what we have since come to call the Holocaust. So this was not just Russian cinema's first attempt, but that of cinema as a medium. I further came to the view in that book uh, that the, had the Soviets not attempted to uh, broach this subject, then British and American cameramen would not have shown, taken images and shown images of the camps they discovered in Germany at the end of the war. So in, in looking at that theme, I asked myself, what was it that Soviet film um, made Soviet film, enabled Soviet film, dare depict violence that per perpetrated against its own population at a time when the British, for example, were reluctant to show such things in cinema, even if they recorded the devastating aftermath of the Blitz? My conclusion was that there was something in Soviet culture more widely, and Soviet culture in particular, uh, Soviet film in particular, apologies, uh, that, which enabled filmmakers to record scenes of horror because they hoped to instrumentalize the gruesome images of the dead in a narrative that would serve to bolster morale 
and mobilize the population to redouble their efforts and commitments to the cause of victory and resistance. The roots of this attitude to death lie in the pre-revolutionary socialist culture of the Red Funeral and can be seen in the very earliest examples of Soviet film, in the films of pioneer Zygovietov. We might begin our narrative in the year of Soviet cinema's origin, a few months before its nationalization in 1919, with the film The Unsealing of the Remains of Sergei of Radonezh. This is a film that has the honor of being claimed by both Zygovietov, of whom uh, more in just a minute, uh, and uh, Lev Kuleshov, who we could, uh, we have the right really to call these people the pioneers of Soviet film cinema. These are both people who were active in the film making business prior to Eisenstein and from whom he uh, took a great deal. This film was an attempt to demonstrate the falsity, if you want, of the Orthodox Church's claim that the remains of an important Orthodox Christian saint, Sergei Sergius of Radonezh, were incorrupt in the terminology, ecclesiastical terminology, i.e. had resisted decay, uh, which is a sign of their uh, uh, sanctitude. The rather crudely made film as you'll, I'll show you in just a second, um, shows the skeleton being taken out of its resting place and exposed as rotten. The film's final image is of a decidedly dead and decayed pile of bones. The point here was to demonstrate the hollow and unconvincing nature of Orthodox Christianity's claims to the miraculous, uh, um, its pretensions to have conquered time, uh, to have overcome death. This is uh, a silent film, and um, the soundtrack you can hear has been put on when it, when it was shown on um, Russian TV with a kind of, well, you can, I think you can guess the sort of implication of the uh, soundtrack. That is Sergei of Radonezh. Yes, it is. Yes, sorry, sorry. Yes, absolutely. I should have said. Yeah. <laughs> yes, playing the part of Sergei of Radonezh. <laughs> yes, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, real method. <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, um, absolutely. So, 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 in place of the veneration of saintly triumph over death. Vertov, in particular, was central to the creation and popularizing of the new cult, that of Lenin, as he made a highly influential film of Lenin's funeral. Uh, Nina, Tumarkin, uh, uh, Nina Tumarkin has argued, uh, this is that slide, uh, uh, no, that was, this is my thing about, I didn't say that, I'll come back, I'll come back to this now uh, before we move on. So this was the, 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 um, analogy between Islamic uh, martyrs uh, and um, Bolshevik martyrs in the sense that the story about them is the most important thing. They don't exist, their, 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 sac their self-sacrifice doesn't exist without someone to tell the story of it. And the same is true, I'm arguing, of uh, uh, Bolshevik martyrs. Uh, Tumarkin uh, argues that the grief of Lenin's death um, might only have been connect, partly connected with him. The lying in state in Moscow, the memorial ceremonies in other cities doubtless functioned as cathartic experiences for a populace that had suffered almost a decade of war, revolution, civil war, famine, epidemics. Lenin's death was the first nationwide ritualized ceremony of mass mourning following those traumatic years. It resulted in a general hysterical frenzy, both aroused by and channeled into the lying in state and mourning meetings held all over the country. The cult of Lenin, established across the country in 1924, 
was to perpetuate grief at Lenin's passing, and in this lay part of its success, for it evoked real feelings derived from the difficult lives led by Soviet citizens in those great years of uh, privation. So she argues that, as it, then that this was only partly about um, uh, Lenin, um, uh, but nevertheless, um, Lenin's funeral recuperates and instrumentalizes the emotions that uh, people uh, feel at this time and reuses them for a, an overarching political narrative. So in the film uh, Leninist Kino Pravda from 1925, uh, Zygovetov, again a documentary film, <laughs> uh, uh, gives the iconography of Lenin's funeral a compelling expression and shows the event as galvanizing the party central committee and the Soviet population who apparently spontaneously express their grief. In cinematic terms, the emphasis is on the unceasing movement of the masses past the open coffin. Lenin's death has become a point of mobilization for the country as grief is molded into a political response. So I'm gonna give you another clip. I'm, I'm, I apologize, this hasn't got uh, any sound at all, so not even an orthodox choir. <laughs> Obviously, the experimental topography is one of the uh, key innovations <laughs> that uh, Lenin introdu uh, that uh, Vertov introduces. The size of letters and so forth, followed up by Eisenstein. <laughs> Stalin. So Bukharin, Stalin, Zinoviev, Kupskaya, mm. and his sister Marie Ivan, uh, Marie Ulyan. Him on the right. <laughs> The, the key thing here is, in late, obviously in later editions, it didn't have, the, the, the sequence of names is always is different. By the 30s, when this was used, obviously this name came first, always. And this face. So again, his wife and his sister.
Pardon? Where is this? Is, is it, it's inside the Kremlin in, um, is it the Hall of Soviets or something like this? Um, yeah, um, one of the buildings, I can't remember which. The Palace of the Soviets. Dvorets Sovietov. Kalon Zal, something like this, yeah. All the columns. And then this final um, banner is, is the key one. The revolution lives on. That should be the end. Right. So, um, the, obviously, the, this, the sequence uh, in general ends with uh, the promise to complete um, Lenin's cause and teachings. And there's a final reel of, uh, of the film which shows mass enrollments in the party. Uh, it shows uh, the progress made by the country, but also this exhortation um, to carry on into the future. So on the tracks of uh, Lenin, full, full speed ahead. So what we see then in this, um, in this film is a sense that uh, obviously <laughs> Len as you, as you, you, Lenin, Lenin may be uh, dead, um, but there's a sort of movement that's going on. So there's a tension really here, which is a sort of obvious and fundamental one in cinema between the, the still and the moving in that, in that sort of uh, sense. And um, we have um, a kind of, um, yeah, this sense that the Lenin is a, a, a point of mobilization for the country's grief. Uh, and, and, it, and so that, that the grief is molded into a, a political response, a political response of joining the party, a, 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 a political response in, in various different ways. Now, the possibilities of using a funeral as a central dramatic point in a process of wider mass mobilization were not, uh, in, fin in film, were not lost on Sergei Eisenstein and, and made central to the construction of Soviet cinemas most famous and most influential work, Barczyk Pachomkin uh, of 1926. The funeral, or rather public display, display of uh, Vakulinchuk's dead body in the city of Odessa, uh, mobilizes huge crowds and serves as the catalyst for the spreading bacillus of revolt from the battleship to the town. Here we see the same logic of contrast between the stasis of the body and the uh, relentless, I mean, I'm not going to show you a clip. I think you all know, I imagine you all know this film so well. Uh, um, but remember, the, this is, is Vakulinchuk uh, in Odessa for a sport, spoonful of borscht, is the uh, um, legend on him. And, uh, and people make all the, everybody, and he, his presence mobilizes the whole town. They all uh, come and, uh, to see him. And the the message is conveyed. Oh, sorry. The message is conveyed in the fine, in the intertitle. Uh, this uh, the dead man. Well, it, a dead man calls for you know calls forth. Uh, sort of uh, summons people. Really, might be a, another way of translating this. He summons people. What to? What for? Is is left um, vague. So um, here we see uh, uh, this same logic, the same contrast, the stasis, but the contrast between the stasis of the body and the relentless movement of the masses, suggesting this transfer of energy from the mourning, um, from the mourning of the dead revolutionary to the fermenting of wider revolutionary movement. Uh, the, and this, this sense of a, a, tri a, a literal triumph over death in that we, you know, instead of uh, stasis, we've got uh, movement. And as I say, that, you know, that's inherent to cinema. Einstein, of course, stressed the contrast between his own use of the funeral scene and Vertov's. Uh, referring to his, quote, mathematically constructed invention which defeated untouched truth. Untouched truth is, is, is referring to Vertov. Uh, um, contemporary critics, such as Kristian Kherskonsky, stressed the similarities, arguing that Barashe Potemkin uh, built on what was best in Vertov. Vertov, of course, saw it differently. He argued that Eisenstein's Barashe Potemkin not only owed a huge uh, debt to Leninist Kinopravda, but that this dramatic reinvention was a toxic drug that drew its power from the depiction of death and violence. Eisenstein evidently not only showed the funeral, he also showed the death of Vakulinchuk, and, and this, in this sort of 
dramatization uh, suggested a path for subsequent Soviet film depictions of the mobilizing power of the death of a martyr. In both cases, though, Eisenstein's and Vertos, we see that death is not a defeat, it's, no, it's only a temporary setback and can be assimilated into an overarching narrative. Vertos' film and Eisenstein's reworking of the funeral trope set a pattern in which death is meaningful, recuperable. While the works of Freud were still being published in the USSR in, uh, in 1926, the discourse of trauma articulated in Freud's uh, 1920 text, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, was not one that had gained acceptance. Its articulation of trauma as uh, a painful experience that cannot be assimilated into a subject's normal understanding and is hence involuntarily reproduced has been used to help us understand the representation of death, violence, uh, and atrocity, and most notably uh, associated with representation of the Holocaust as, uh, as traumatic. However, in the Soviet context, this narrative gained very little traction and I, would, I want to suggest that it's precisely because of this funeral paradigm, this sense that violence and martyrdom are meaningful, the, the very paradigm you're seeing established in the 1920s, which, represented, which enabled the representation of death, mourning, and violence as part of a meaningful narrative arc, a progressive historical trajectory that ultimately justified this sacrifice. And that understanding of death is incompatible with uh, the, the Freud's insight into trauma. Let us move on, um, and let us move to the 1930s. So the pattern we've seen established in the 1920s uh, continues in 1930s cinema and the era of sound. It would be self-evidently self it continues in Vertov's own work in the 1934 film Three Songs of Lenin. Um, and, but a, a particularly interesting use of sound um, and and one that mobilizes the possibilities of song uh, in a way that's characteristic of, uh, of Shostakovich, as John Riley's written about, um, is, um, is the film The Youth of Maxime. This is a film that makes a funeral a key moment in the protagonist's transformation from passive bystander to active revolutionary. So this, this film, sorry, I should introduce it for those who don't know it, um, so it's the, basically it's the, uh, a, a sort of conversion narrative or a coming to consciousness narrative of a, a quite anarchic um, Leningrad, or sorry, a Petersburg uh, worker who becomes a communist. Um, and it's a three-part thing and it ends up with uh, the final part uh, takes us up to the revolution uh, in which he takes a, a, an important part. But he is a fictional character, this is, and this is a fictional film. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, so, um, uh, so th this is, um, so we have this, at this point in the film, Maxime, so he, he, he uh, you're gonna, I'm gonna show you a scene, not this scene of a funeral. At this point in the, in the film, Maxime is wavering with some sympathy for the revolutionaries, growing sympathy for the revolutionaries, but he's also being approached to become a police informer. His friend André then is killed at work in, due to poor safety conditions, and this is followed by the death of another worker whose comrades insist on burying him according to their own workers' right, singing the song uh, that, had been a, that had been central to traditions of the Red Funeral since the 1890s, you fell as a victim or sacrifice um, in uh, the struggle, in the fatal struggle. Okay, so this is the, um, so those are the words of the song in, in Russian and English. It, there's about, well, there are many verses, there are about four verses, let's, uh, 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 let's say, something like that. Um, and this was a, a song that was sung throughout the country in these meetings, not entirely spontaneous, of course, um, called to mark Lenin's death. Um, it was sung alongside, uh, as it was as widely sung uh, in 1924 on the, on the occasion of Lenin's death as the Internationale, which is, of course, the uh, not only the anthem of the international communist movement, but the, an the national anthem, if you want, of the USSR until 1943. So that's its first uh, verse. Now, um, I'm going to, so I'm going to play you this uh, clip from um, uh, Maxime. So just, there's a, there is, before they start singing uh, words to the effect that you've just seen, there's a 
tiny piece of dialogue which uh, is, goodbye comrade, we shall bury, bury you in our own way as a worker. Um, This is the main character. part of the communist underground themselves.
So, so what we see here with these uh, close-ups, reaction shots of Maxime's thought processes, you know, we, so we, we see the sort of, he's actually transforming in front of our eyes with this, uh, this soundtrack. So it's sort of, obviously the song is, is key, but it's, it's a, a sense of what's happening inside his uh, mind during the course of this funeral. And obviously he's unable to, um, he's, you know, at first he's simply a bystander, but he's more, then he's uh, listening, then he's marching, and eventually just, just before this bit, at the end, we see he's singing too. Uh, and um, after a confrontation with the uh, police, uh, he then becomes, he gets caught up in uh, being a, a revolutionary himself. Um, he starts, he jumps up on a lamppost and says, don't go home, the, 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 the guy who's dead sort of went, was sort of quiet and did what he was told. That's the, you know, that way lies death, we have to re re revolt. Uh, and, uh, and so he gets up and starts throwing leaflets all over the place and, and becomes a, a revolutionary after becoming involved in this ritual process of the uh, Red Funeral. So, uh, and this is the first stage really in his uh, progress to the life of a professional revolutionary, which is what we're told. So um, this, is, this is, again, this sense that um, activism is the path to immortality, um, that being part of this movement uh, is a way of imparting death with or giving de death meaning, and uh, death can be recuperated by uh, ultimate victory of the cause. It's a kind of down payment that will be sort of cashed in, uh, in eternity somewhere. So, uh, or in the future somewhere rather. Now this vision was going to be both vindicated and challenged by the unprecedented violence of World War II and the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. The Soviets were initially uncertain how to represent World War II, or obviously that we could, we might, as, as, as it's referred to in, in Russia, the Great Patriotic War, uh, beginning in uh, June 1941 with the Nazi invasion of uh, the Soviet Union. They were uncertain because it did not follow the pattern they had anticipated for this long anticipated war with Western imperialist powers. It was, after all, an initially catastrophic defensive war on their own territory rather than offensive war on enemy soil, uh, as they imagined it would be. Before long, however, as they began to win back territory from the enemy, the Soviets began to forge certain templates for the depiction not only of heroism and of victories, but also for the crimes committed by the Nazis against the Soviet pop population. This meant the depiction of Nazi atrocities. But they had to be represented as against the Soviet population as a whole. Crimes committed specifically against the Soviet Jewish population had to be subsumed in a wider universalization of victimhood. Such representations also had to stress the Soviet people's heroic resistance, not collaboration or anything like that, uh, or, or willing, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, yeah, willing working with the Germans, for example, as, as happened in certain places. Uh, and they had to exhort the population to avenge deaths and atrocities. Now, I'm not going to show you, I'm going to avoid showing you uh, horrible images of mangled corpses today, uh, which is, uh, suffice to say that I do have a book that's full of that kind of stuff, uh, if, 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 if that, but I think you can picture uh, in your minds I, uh, some of the kinds of images we might be thinking about when we talk about the fact that the Soviets were willing to depict uh, atrocities. So a, a particularly successful vehicle for this message of active resistance and of universalization, sometimes russification of uh, victimhood, of, of uh, yeah, victimhood, was the partisan film. Now, this is probably the most famous of those films, uh, a film about the uh, life of Zoya Kosmodemianska, an 18-year-old Moscow schoolgirl who was killed by the Germans after being captured on a mission behind enemy lines in November 1941. Um, more recently, there's been some debate about exactly what happened and so forth. Uh, I, I don't, we don't need to touch upon that here, really. In the 1944 film adaptation by Lev Anstam, as she is being tortured, she is repeatedly asked who she is, because uh, she had a 
pseudonym, she, we, we know as Zoya, but her code name as, a, as an agent was Tanya. Um, so she, she, but she doesn't even say that her name is Tanya. She's being tortured and uh, asked who she is. Her answer begins, her answer is not a verbal one to the Germans, it's a sort of philosophical one to herself. And we see this uh, inner diegesis, this, it, this inner vision of what she's uh, thinking, which begins, the answer to her identity begins with uh, Lenin's funeral. Um, so, in other words, as we'll see, the, uh, her willingness to fight and to sacrifice herself for the Soviet cause has to be understood, at least the film implies that, through the prism of Lenin's funeral. His martyrdom inspires hers. Who are you? No. Sorry about the poor quality of the image you're going to see. So today is Lenin's funeral. This is the front page of Pravda from 1924. Thing. Hopefully you remember them. Birth certificate being written out of, of Zoya Kosmodiansko. So um, it is this background that enables Zoya, in the final scene of the film, that of her execution, to pronounce the famous uh, words, uh, probably po quite possibly made up by a journalist uh, uh, afterwards. But uh, uh, this is apparently what she said: "Why are you looking so sad? Be brave, fight, beat the Germans, burn, trample them. I'm not afraid to die, comrades. It is a joy, it is shastya." Uh, die to die for one's people and to the Germans you hang me now but I'm not alone there are 200 million of us you can't hang us all they will avenge me that's not exactly the dialogue you have in the film but pretty much it I'm going to show you that final scene obviously the, the villagers are made to watch it all and she has a sign around her saying arsonist Exactly. 
Um, when y yes, you're at, there's a 1940, there's a 1960s um, restoration. Is that, that is that what you're asking? Um, I I'm pretty sure it's the 1944 version because I have them both, and I I like to use the earlier ones when I can. But it's if, if there was a flaw with it, I might have ended up using the later one and, and hope and and, and and not have thought that you'd notice. But uh, well done for noticing. Uh, and uh, so I'm not going to uh, yes, I, I can't put my hand on my heart and be absolutely certain. Um, Ge I mean, the thing is, generally speaking, well, um, generally speaking, the, the, the kinds of things that change in those soundtracks later on, they, de I mean, you may have other ideas, but um, it tends to be the Germans are there, there there's less German dialogue uh, in the uh, later 1960s um, re-editing. There's uh, often, they're not referred to as when it's German, there's, there's, no, there's less of anti-German sentiment and more anti-fascist sentiment. Uh, 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 and uh, So those are the kinds of things you notice much more. And also images of Stalin tend to be uh, absent. So I, I mean, I'm pretty sure this is the early one because I, I, th I think they would have cut out the uh, image of Stalin um, in the 1960s version. Oh, I'm not absolutely certain though, <laughs> so, but good point. Um, so, um, here, even here, we see a, a, sh a shift. Even if I say there's a certain continuity, obviously a continuity with the, the sense in which her sacrifice is framed with regard, with regard to a sense that she is um, inspired by the example of Lenin, to, uh, on whose, uh, the, day, the day of whose death she's born. Interestingly, we see Lenin's funeral, but we don't see images of Lenin dead in, I mean, maybe that would be too obvious to have Lenin there and then she's laid out the, the baby in a, a, you know, it would be, too, it would be too much of a sense that this baby is lying there ready to be sacrificed 18 years later, um, it, just as Lenin uh, was. But here the shift is not so much, you know, she's not sacrificing herself so much for a better society. Notice, you know, after she, she, that she dies, it's all about vengeance. It's, you know, a response in battle is the key thing. Um, and uh, so there's, obviously there's no funeral. Zoya's body, she's, her, her body hung from the scaffolding for, um, for some weeks after this. And um, so we don't have, so it's, it's a quite a slight, it's, it is already a, uh, a, a sort of different uh, take upon the sense of self-sacrifice. So in a, further, in a further departure during the war, some wartime films were not uh, able even as far as Zoya does, to assimilate all this death and suffering <coughs> into the existing paradigm of the red funeral and of meaningful sacrificial death. It was simply too hard to believe that so many people's death were part of a utopian logic, a vision of history as redemptive and progressive. Moreover, those killed, such as secularized ethnic Jews, were often not dying for their beliefs, but rather being murdered because of their inherited cultural identity. Thus, a dimension of wartime losses that was particularly hard to assimilate in the Soviet logic of the funeral and of meaningful martyrdom was the mass murder of Soviet Jews, over one and a half million of whom were killed by the Germans in 1941 and 42 in the mass shootings of the first stage of what we have since come to call the Holocaust. The, this topic was very marginally addressed in um, Soviet film, but it was addressed in some of those films. Um, most notably, in a film by um, the director Mark Danskoy, a 1945 film called uh, The Unvanquished, Nipakaryoni um, uh, is the Russian title. And this was released in October 1945. Uh, didn't have a very wide release, but it was released. In this film, as you'll, as you'll see in just a second, we have a traditional red funeral for a worker killed defying the Germans, but it is interrupted as the mourners see the, the, worker is, the worker is Ukrainian and the, um, the, the, the uh, workers um, uh, who are his pallbearers are also Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians. Um, they see a crowd of Jews being herded to their death. The main character, the uh, guy with the moustache, you'll see Ukrainian worker Taras. He recognizes the family doctor, Aran Davidovich, amongst the Jews. And I'm, I'm going to translate the dialogue because you're going to see the sequence and it has no subtitles. And he bows to him and the dialogue goes like this. Aron Davidovich, uh, were you saying this to me? 
to you and to your sufferings. Thank you, human being. It's, it's somewhat saccharine, you might say, but uh, it's, well, have a look. So we'll give you a, uh, you uh, lived honorably, we'll give you an honorable burial. Yeah, I apologize for the fault with my copy. It's got this slight jumpy thing. This was filmed in Kiev, uh, and one of the scenes was filmed on the site of Babi Yar, the most famous site of the Holocaust in the former Soviet Union. This is the director's own son, the little boy with black curly hair.
So what we see here, I think you'll agree, is there's no sense of martyrdom, of death being recuperated by even a potential ultimate victory. This is, and the, and the ultimate narrative of the film, even though it doesn't end with the liberation of, of the um, city, it doesn't seem to sort of tie up this narrative, um, you know, this, this, this dead end in the narrative of the a whole number of the main characters being killed. Uh, Aron Davidic is, is a main character, he's there from the very beginning of the film, and he's suddenly, uh, you know, killed in this way. So, uh, along with, well, thousands of other of his fellow citizens. So martyrdom is not recuperated by ultimate victory. It is a tragic loss that cannot be assimilated into the established or any established narrative. Here we are close to the notion of trauma in the sense of unassimilable experience. Um, and it was this sense that the war meant enormous losses and that the deaths were not those of believers, but bystanders, that meant that it could not easily be contained within the existing narrative of the Red Funeral, of, of meaningful, conscious martyrdom. This caused the war to be so difficult a theme in the late Stalin years, when very few war films were made. Moving on to the last part of my talk, and this is, I, I won't, I'll try not to take too long about that, the uncertainty as to how to, about the post-war period, the uncertainty as to how to contain the shift away from utopian aspirations lies at the heart of the crackdown in the arts, including the cinema that came at the end of World War II. Images symbolizing the achievement of victory were sought in order to distract people in part from the enormous price paid. Wartime sacrifice and memory of it now had to be subsumed within reverence of the Stalin cult. It was in this context that one of the great cultic films, uh, Ciarelli's The Vow, Kleatva from 1946, was uh, made in which again the imagery of Lenin's funeral was reworked, but so as not to show the body at all. Uh, what you have is a very, so is, I mean, if you, if you laughed at uh, the at original film, I think you'd, you'd uh, it would be bad for your health uh, to, to see this one. It might just uh, cause you hysterics uh, just to, uh, uh, on too protracted a level. Uh, so uh, Stalin uh, has all these flashbacks to Lenin talking to him in the Kremlin, and uh, then he gets up on the um, mausoleum, and uh, people sort of uh, tell him to... Uh, you know, they, they, he, you know, they basically, uh, he, there's a kind of very strange, this, the main message is, we will not give Le Lenin to anyone. We, Nikamu ni atadim Lenin. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, I don't know who wanted to take Lenin, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, apparently they're not going to let him go. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but, I mean, my understanding of this was uh, that essentially that this is a more nationalist Lenin. He's not an internationalist figure anymore. Um, and the whole uh, thing is about, um, uh, it's about sanitizing. Even the cult of Lenin has the whole uh, genuine mourning that uh, I think you can sort of see there's a sort of, uh, an attempt to create a sense of uh, real loss in the 1925 film by uh, Vertov, obviously the footage taken in 1924, um, that m sense of mourning is very much sanitized because it might touch upon uh, the open wound of memory of World War II. And, in, and, the, and the whole internationalist dimension of Lenin is, 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 is nationalized and uh, the main lessons uh, are um, about defending and expanding the Soviet Union. That's the that, was the that was the main thing that uh, Lenin taught, apparently. Uh, however, so you might think uh, the Lenin cult is completely subsumed under the Stalin cult, and that might be true in a way, but there's a very, there's a strange uh, irony in that um, Vertov's wife, uh, I'm sorry about the slide, uh, Elizabeth Svilova, um, she was not just his wife, she was we pro we're starting to understand now that she was probably uh, an equal partner uh, with him in the creation of all of his films because he didn't uh, he wasn't able to edit nobody was willing to edit like he wanted like he imagined you could edit uh, by cutting things up into very short 
um, uh, bits uh, other than Sulava. So she agreed to do that and, and delivered on it. And in that sense, uh, and, and, and increasingly started to get directorial credits uh, uh, throughout the course of her life. She had to collaborate with Michael Ciaurelli, who's the, uh, who made The Vow, the great, uh, the, uh, and, and other important um, films for the kind of population, popularization of the post-war Stalin cult. So curiously, um, Svilova then has a hand in making uh, the, the film of, of Stalin's funeral, the, uh, the Great Farewell, Velika Prashanya. Here, uh, we do have grief. We do have, obviously, Stalin's body. Um, uh, you know, uh, I don't think they can get away without having his body at, in a film about his funeral. Uh, um, but um, the rhetoric, again, is very similar to the vow. It's all about projecting the power of the already existing uh, Soviet Union. Now, this film, obviously, uh, is a sign of Stalin's death. Um, and Stalin's death unleashed this a process, as people will probably know, of reassessment of identity in which the wartime sacrifice became the dominant theme of Soviet culture and Soviet filmmakers were key to the reassessment of martyrdom and its meaning. The uncertainty and debate about Soviet identity displaced the trope of the funeral as heroic martyrdom implying self-sacrifice for a collective goal was undermined by the complex shift inaugurated by the war. Um, and we can see an illustration of that in Tarkovsky's uh, Ivan's Childhood. Uh, the philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a very famous uh, review of the film in which he drew attention to the fact that Ivan's death, nothing will compensate, no victory, nothing will ever compensate for Ivan's death. His death is sort of it, like Dostoevsky's death of a child. It's something that there's, there's no recompense for. And so it's unrecuperable um, by victory. This is something that is, you know, and we've seen it as a marginal theme expressed during the war by, um, in, in the depiction of the Holocaust, in, very marginally in Soviet cinema. And suddenly, a, a director uh, such as Tarkovsky makes a film that is internationally exported, wins um, a prize, an important, prestigious international prize at the Venice Film Festival. Uh, and that's, you know, it's a sort of, and, and, that, and he's not the only one exploring the sense that um, victory is all very well, but the loss is incalculable and, uh, and can never be uh, compensated. So it's not meaningful martyrdom in the same way as we had in the pre-war pre period. Um, nevertheless, the traditions of meaningful martyrdom left a deep cultural imprint so that the discourse of trauma, the notion of suffering that cannot be assimilated or made meaningful, has not to this day gained a deep foothold in the Russian collective memory. Despite more cause and occasion for traumatic reactions than most countries' history, you might think. And by analyzing Russian film, we can tra trace the process by which this came to be so, how Russian collective memory has been shaped and has itself uh, shaped, uh, sh and how film has itself shaped that collective memory. I hope today to have uh, contributed a tiny bit then to our uh, deeper understanding of that process, and I'll stop there.